This is the Hockey News Podcast. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Hockey News Fantasy Podcast, powered by BetMGM. It's Matt Larkin here with Stephen Ellis, of course, always lurking, ready to fire questions at me. And I'm excited to talk fantasy. We're getting close to the All-Star break. I think it's a great time to take stock of your teams. I will be producing an updated top 250 rankings very soon. But before we get to that in a couple days, let's talk about your leagues. And I'll talk about my league first to start off the podcast. Things are still going well. My team is 36 games over 500, so again, it means you can still trust me for now, but I am approaching a very big dilemma. My Kings goaltenders, because we my league format, we have tandems, and my Kings goalies are starting to let me down. Cal Peterson, Jonathan Quick turning back into a pumpkin. I know I have to go out and acquire a better goalie tandem for my to, to sort of go along with Jordan Bennington and Billy Huso, who I have as well, but do I sacrifice the future? Do I trade Kirill Kaprizov, my best keeper? I don't know. I'm thinking about it. I don't want to fly too co- too close to the sun, screw up my great season, so we'll see what happens. I'm starting to get nervous, though. A big decision looms. And it's funny, I mentioned Bennington and Huso because we're going to start off this podcast talking about them. Uh, our pickups of the week, we're going to start with Shallow Leaks, and it's Billy Huso, goaltender St. Louis Blues, available in 37% of leagues. I've gotten a lot of questions about Billy Huso recently, and I feel qualified to talk about it because he's my goalie, too, in my league. And it's very interesting... Everyone wants to know, who do I trust down the stretch, Huso or Bennington? But if we sort of break it down, the answer might not be what you think, okay? So every year there is some kind of league winner goaltender that emerges unexpectedly. You could argue it was Jack Campbell last year. Huso, on a per-game basis, has been the best goaltender in the NHL this year. He leads the league in goals against average and save percentage. In 5-on-5 play, the only goalie that's that's ahead of him in goals saved above average per 60 minutes uh, is Igor Shesterkin among qualified leaders. So Shesterkin has been the best goalie in the game, but in terms of rate stats, who's, who's right there with Shesterkin to give you an idea of how good he's been. And if we look at the start breakdown in St. Louis, since January 1st, Billy Huso has started eight games. Jordan Bennington has started five games. Bennington in his past 10 starts, 890 save percentage. And it's not like, because you could say, well, he, he got bombed in his last two starts, but he's been below a 900 save percentage six times over that stretch. So he's been consistently poor. And I think you have to start looking the situation looking at the situation differently now and thinking of Huso as maybe the better fantasy option for the rest of the fantasy season. Maybe in real life the Blues are going to give Bennington more leash come playoff time. He's won them a Stanley Cup, so I wouldn't be surprised if he gets another shot. But right now it seems like the power balance has already shifted. Huso's playing more than Bennington. He's playing much better. So I think he's a must-own. I think he should be owned, Billy Huso, in all leagues right now. So that is your shallow league pickup of the week. Now, let's see. Medium leagues. We're going to go with Anton Lindell, sensational rookie of the Florida Panthers, available in 72% of leagues. He was just named the NHL Rookie of the Month for January. And what I'm telling you to do here is let everybody else chase the Mason Marchment six-point game. He's playing great as well but I think it's far less likely he sustains what he's doing than, than it is for Lundell to sustain. Lundell got five assists in that game, but overshadowed by Marchman. Lundell, you can look at that big game, but he actually has 25 points in his past 25 games. He's playing excellent hockey. They call him, of course, Baby Barkov in Florida because he's a great two-way player. And you're, you're not quite getting a multi-category fantasy force with him, but he's, I think, a great asset in a few categories. So assists, he's got 18 assists in his past 25 games. Uh, obviously he's been a monster in plus minus he's plus 25 in his past 25 games. We know we don't really care about plus minus as a real life stat anymore, but a lot of fantasy leagues still use it. So if you do use it, Lundell is a huge asset. And he actually, because he's so good defensively in terms of just his hockey IQ for a young kid, he blocks a lot of shots. He gets you a lot more blocks than the average forward gets in fantasy. So that is a nice bonus. So I'd say get on the Lindell train instead of getting on the Marshman train. Lindell is the one with the first round pedigree. He was one of the better prospects in his draft class. So I think it's possible he sustains what he's doing right now or something close to it. Now let's do the deep league pickup of the week. Michael Bunting, available in 73% of leagues. And it's very interesting to me to see what's happening because we know, of course, Kyle Dubas bet on himself to replace Zach Hyman for cheap. 
He decided it wasn't worth paying Hyman what he wanted. He let Hyman go. And we're halfway through the season now. And Bunting, he's kind of doing a pretty decent Zach Hyman uh, imitation. The numbers aren't quite as good, but they're pretty close. In his past 23 games, he's got nine goals and 21 points. So for the last month or two, he's actually been better than Zach Hyman. And it's a similar setup to Hyman. Hyman was never the big power play asset. He was great for even strength in fantasy. And so far, that's sort of the profile of Bunting. He's not on the top power play unit, but he's got that plum assignment with Austin Matthews and Mitch Marner. Marner has come back from quarantine absolutely on fire. So that top line, I think, is really starting to move at the moment. We saw Bunting had the hat trick the other day. So I think he's going to be an asset all season long, and he's going to finish with kind of similar numbers to what Hyman was doing when he was a Leaf. And of course, the Leafs got him for much cheaper. Now, the WTF pickup of the week. This is where I'm going to got to snap. I got to clap, snap my fingers, get your attention. Get out there. Go pick up Kevin Fiala. What are you doing? He's available in 24% of leagues. And we know the drill with Kevin Fiala now. When he gets hot, he is unbelievable. It happens every season. He goes on one of these ridiculous runs. I feel like it's Kevin Fiala and Mika Zibanejad are probably the two streakiest players in the NHL. When they get hot, they get hot for a long time, and it feels like they just can't stop scoring. And right now, Kevin Fiala has begun one of those streaks. It's an 11-game point streak. He's got eight goals, 14 points in his past 11 games. He's got 35 shots, so really useful in shots leagues especially. And he has struck up this great chemistry with the big-time prospect Matt Boldy, who I've recommended before on this podcast. He's got nine points in nine games. So Fiala and Boldy are really starting to click together on a line, and we know now the Wild have said they've kept Boldy long enough to activate his entry-level deal. He's too valuable to them to send him back down. He's just been too good. So that's great news for Fiala as well. It's more likely that Fiala can, can sustain this super hot streak because there always is one. The thing to watch out for with Fiala is if you see signs of a slump starting again, he could go cold for a while. That's sort of the way it works with him. But while he's hot, and he is, you definitely want to ride him in, I think, all leagues, even the shallowest of leagues. Okay, now, the tip of the week. The way I've put it on our website, uh, I say be Don Draper. I'm just being cute about it. What I'm trying to say is advertise. So if you're in a position, this is more common with seller teams that have a, a really big asset that a lot of other teams might want. Make sure you don't just deal with one team and have a look at what they have to offer and accept it. Advertise if in doubt, because you never know who else might be out there. This has happened to me tons of times where I decided, oh, okay, I'm going to put some chum in the water and advertise that this player is available. And then a GM that I did not expect to even be interested based on where they are in the standings comes forward and makes an offer. So you broaden your horizons. You might get more offers than you're expecting. Now, this strategy, it doesn't always work. Uh, I think it works a lot better if it's a really good player. So I said seller teams, this is great advice for them. If you're putting on putting a stud on the block that you know will be attractive to everyone, I think it pays to advertise. If it's a marginal player that is slumping, and if you look under the hood, someone will find that, you don't want to advertise because that what that's going to do is get people on your message board chirping you. Someone's going to say, oh, yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah, where do I sign? This guy's got no points in his last 11 games. And then people start piling on. This has happened to me before, too, because I'm, I'm a villain in my league. It's my personality in, in my fantasy leagues. People love to pile on. So you have to tread carefully. I would say advertising does help but more if you're dealing a really good player that you know people will be interested in league-wide. Okay, Stephen, I think it's time to get some questions going. If you're ready, I'm ready, buddy. Well, I just kind of want to bring up something about Vili So it's, man, we've seen this before, this whole story, right? This, this older prospect kind of coming in after years in the AHL, not really giving a chance to shine, and then he's kind of doing something. And the thing about him, for as good as he's played this year, it's still a guy with, 32 games as a sample size where last year he was not abysmal but he had a positive record but his stats were not good and he's kind of figured it out this year um but this is one where it's like you, you kind of look jake allen looks fantastic uh near the end of his time in st louis it's almost like the back of goal he's been the one getting the better opportunities in a way and always in St. Louis, if it goes back to Brian Elliott and Yaroslav Halak, Brian Elliott plays like a god. Then it's Jake Allen and Brian Elliott. And then it's, just, it's a weird, it's a time-honored tradition in St. Louis. I don't know so, what the deal is there. If you're a goalie, you don't want to start as a sign as a starting goalie in St. Louis. You want to be the backup goalie. That's where your opportunities will come in. So uh, we'll, we'll kind of see how that goes. I'm, I'm not convinced he's the answer, but I'm also not convinced Bennington's the answer either. Mm -hmm. All right, first question from Eamon Devlin. Line A, under what conditions would you keep or target him? 
Yeah, I, I think if you are in a goals league, Patrick Laine definitely has value, especially because you could argue he's sort of playing in relative obscurity now. I don't think he gets talked about as much as he did when he was in a Canadian market. All due respect to Columbus, players sometimes get a little bit lost there. And aside from his great fashion that you see occasionally, you don't see a lot of Laine highlights these days. He's kind of hiding there. And he's quietly scoring at a 34 goal pace. So I think he has something to offer. He's still shooting the puck a decent amount. So to me, I, I kind of like him as a buy low in a redraft league because he's one of those players, especially if you're in a league with some kind of casual players, his surface numbers, he's missed time to injury and also the death of his father. He's only played 24 games, right? So the surface numbers are not that sexy. And sometimes it sounds crazy that someone would fall for that, but it's a subconscious thing when you can't visualize what their full season numbers would be. And it's easier to get someone to part with that player because their their overall, their sample size is small. Uh, and, when you're looking at his keeper value, to me, it's 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 there, but it's about maybe recalibrating expectations for who Line A is going to be. And I was definitely driving the Line A is going to be Alex Ovechkin and the best scorer of this coming generation bus. I didn't realize it was going to be Austin Matthews. He's the best goal scorer in the world now. Uh, I thought it was going to be Line A a few years back. It doesn't mean it still couldn't be. His shot is unbelievable, but... I think he's trending toward a Phil Kessel type of career, which is still a great career. Kessel's got almost 400 goals. He's got more than 900 points. And I think that's kind of where Line A is going to be. And Kessel, again, Kessel was a top top five draft pick. So similar situation in terms of pedigree. If we can accept that he's just going to be a Phil Kessel, then Phil Kessel in his prime would have been a player you want to keep. It just wouldn't be one of your top two elite keepers. So if you're in a league where you're keeping maybe five players, something like that, then I think you consider Line A as someone who's going to get you 35 goals a year, maybe not 50. We've been sort of waiting for the Rocket Richard type season and it hasn't happened. Maybe it won't, but he's still going to be valuable. All right. The next question comes from my favorite name of the question askers today, the Zegris Disaster Plan. At this point in his career, is it worth moving Ovi or do you expect him to finish out his career as an effective point scorer? It's worth mentioning that Ovi just minutes ago just announced that he will not go to the All-Star game due to a positive uh, COVID test, which not the COVID's uh, a positive test ever is a good thing. It's, it's just interesting timing for a guy who's known to like to skip the All-Star game, isn't it? Yeah, very interesting timing. Th this is an interesting uh, name for a, for a, a question asker too. Zegris disaster plan. I feel like this might be John Tortorella secretly asking this question. Who knows? Uh, uh, yeah, with Ovi, the context always matters. Um, I don't think you're moving him in a redraft league. He's still God right now, and he's still going to be challenging for the Rocket Richard Trophy. He still gets so many hits. His, sh his shot output has actually gone way back up this year. It's his best in years. So in most formats, he's actually still the number one overall fantasy player because he, he contributes to so many categories. And I've said this for his whole career. He's pretty much a cheat code. It's kind of like... If you're a fantasy baseball fan, having Randy Johnson back in the day when he would get like 370 strikeouts, and it was just unfair. It was like each of his starts was two starts from another good pitcher. And Ovi's similar, I think, in terms of his just overall overwhelming stat contributions. That said, if you're looking at uh, keeper value, so value over the next few seasons, I think you could argue he's a sell high. Um I think he's still going to have great goal scoring seasons, multiple great goal scoring seasons left. He keeps himself in great condition. He's very, he's extremely durable. I think we're going to be looking at 30 goals, 200 shots as his floor for several more seasons. Again, floor. I think that's the worst he's going to be. He's going to be chasing that goal record. He's going to keep scoring. That's why he signed the contract extension. Uh, but I think the sell high factor this year, where it comes from, is the assist production has been strange this year. Ovi has not been this type of playmaker for a decade, maybe more. Uh, and he's just assisting on far more goals this year, but that, that balloon is already starting to burst. He's got two assists in his past 13 games, which I assume coincides with Nicholas Backstrom coming back. So there's less pressure on Ovi to do everything and try and set up his teammates because now you have Backstrom back in the lineup as well as Kuznetsov. So that's already kind of reverting. And to me, his overall numbers are showing that he's a playmaker, but it's sort of reversing back to his normal form so if you can get someone to pay for for ovechkin the 100 point score then do it but i think he's still going to be a 40 goal 80 point guy you know even next year maybe the year after since i've been a hockey fan enough to kind of follow it in a capacity more than hey there's a game on tv this is cool ovechkin's been one of the best players in the world i'm not ready to kind of see that go away so uh, i hope it's a few more years all right Shane Simpson asks, what's the coolest fantasy league format you've ever been a part of? 
Yeah. Okay. There's one Shane. It it absolutely dominates the others. It's so cool. Um, but it's not hockey. But I'm curious if this would translate to hockey. So I do want to talk about it. Uh, I'm not sure if you've ever heard of the vampire draft format. Okay. So I've done it in fantasy football. I have two fantasy football leagues. One of them is the vampire. So the way the vampire works is when you start the league, the first year you you can do a draw. Whoever somebody gets to be the vampire, and you have a full draft. The vampire does not get to participate. Vampire can't draft anyone or you just rig the draft so that it picks all the worst players in the whole league that don't even play in the NHL. So once the draft is over, the vampire is allowed to populate their team using only the waiver wire. Everybody else that drafted a team, you cannot make any roster moves for the rest of the season. So you draft a, draft a really deep bench to account for injuries. And it's a head-to-head -head format. Every week you play the vampire. If the vampire defeats you with their team of waiver wire ragtag players, they get to steal any player they want from your team, assuming you started that player. So as the season progresses, you have to make decisions. Do you want to risk your best players against the vampire or do you want to take a dive? But every time the vampire wins, the vampire's evil grows more powerful because it will envelop good players. And so what usually happens is as the season progresses, the vampire gets more and more powerful. And then by the end of the year, the vampire could have the best team in the league, depending on if it beat an opponent that took a risk and started the best player. So it's really fun. And the format, the way we do it is if the vampire... Uh, you know, rises up and wins, which happened in my fantasy football league this year, then evil has not been defeated. The vampire reigns supreme. And that person gets to be the vampire again the next year. So I don't know how it would work in hockey, but I would certainly like to see it happen because it's really fun in football. And it's also a, a, a format that's not very labor intensive because you can't touch your team during the year. It's exhausting if you are the vampire, but for every, every other gym in the league, it's actually not a whole lot of work. The draft is your biggest commitment. So it's fun and it's pretty easy to do. Okay, that's actually really cool. I've never heard of anything like that. That's that's pretty unique. You need and, more of like fun formats in hockey. Yeah, for sure. And, and what the, the best part is that you, we get in big debates because this has happened before where it's late in the season. And it's like, oh, the vampire is only a couple points out of a playoff spot. Uh, I, I'm benching my team. We, I don't want to. I don't want to risk it. I think my team can go all the way. And then the other jams in the league are like, "Come on, no, don't take a dive. Like, just we can, we can knock the vampire out of the playoffs." And you get in these big fights over what to do, like the vampire strategy. So yeah, it's fun. <laughs> okay, that's a new one. All right, Ivan asks, "Who is one player that's heavily in the trade rumor mill that you think could get a big boost fantasy wise with a new team?" Obviously, we don't know which new team a certain player would go to, but I guess yeah. maybe the assumption is that the team they're on is just not giving them good opportunities. For sure, I, I think that the most obvious pick is definitely Mark Andre Fleury. Uh, he's been linked to the Edmonton Oilers. He was linked earlier this season to the Colorado Avalanche, but I think their goaltending is starting to fit, to sort of sort itself out. Uh, he's been linked to the Washington Capitals, but no matter where he goes, if he's landing in, in not Chicago, AKA team that has sort of left him hung out to dry a lot, especially early in the season, his numbers will improve drastically. And I think he could be instantly a top five fantasy goaltender again, especially because the team acquiring him, they're not going to bring him into platoon or something. He'll get good volume as well. So that's the obvious pick. I think you have to keep an eye on John Klingberg as well, depending on what the Dallas Stars do, but we know he's been on the block and it's fairly likely they're going to trade him rather than lose him for nothing in the off season. So if you land John Klingberg on a team with a really high powered offense with his puck moving skills, he could start putting up massive point totals as well. And if you're looking at a sleeper, we talked about this on our main podcast this week, Jeff Petrie, not an easy contract to move four years left at more than $6 million. But if you do work out a deal, that's someone who, could quickly rediscover his previous fantasy value. So the example I used on our podcast earlier this week was Colorado because they could send Eric Johnson's contract the other way. If you drop Jeff Petrie onto Colorado, I think he's, he sort of returns to last year's Jeff Petrie in a hurry. So that's someone to sort of keep a close eye on if Montreal can find a deal for him. All right, next question it comes from Sean Gruzowski. Hughes, Truba, Sider, Carlson, and Byram. Martinez available on waivers. Drop Byram for him or stay put. Keeper league, D goals equal three. Assists equal one. No outlier stats. Thanks, Matt. I've also never been in a league where defensive goals meant more, but maybe that's really what I got to be doing in the future. And I assume no outlier stats means like no shots, plus minus hits, power play points, and anything else. That's my interpretation of the question. Hopefully I'm right, Sean. Um, to me, you're going to want to keep Byron in this situation for, for multiple reasons. Yes, the concussion stuff is very scary for him. Hopefully, it's sort of like an Aaron Eckblad thing where it was 
scary at the beginning of the career and eventually he got several years removed from it. We're not there yet with Byron, but I'm hoping for his sake he gets there. Uh, but his upside, it's just so much greater than Alec Martinez's. Uh, Byron, you know, he's one of the best defense prospects in the NHL. A couple of years ago, our scouting panel for our Future Watch magazine ranked Bowen Byron as the best prospect in the NHL at any position. So he's got so much potential as a puck mover who can sort of play all situations. Uh, and if you look at Alec Martinez, Yes, he had a really good year last year, but it was a little bit fluky. He's been more of a two-way guy most of his career. And based on the stats configuration I'm seeing from your league, if it doesn't count blocks, then Alec Martinez is not nearly as valuable. That's his biggest contribution. He's usually one of the league leaders in blocks. So you're not getting that from him. Uh, he, of course, has not been healthy either, so he's coming back. And then when I was looking at your question earlier, I reread it and I said, oh, I saw the word keeper. And I said, oh my God, keeper league? Now it's an easy question, actually. If the keeper element is in there too, then it's Bowen Byram, hands down. And do not drop him for Alec Martinez because in a keeper format, you can afford to wait out this scary concussion situation and eventually, hopefully, get a really good defenseman on your team. All right, I like that one. All right, Marcus Beasley. I recently made this blockbuster. Please evaluate and give your opinion on the players involved. I traded Malkin, Connor, Devon Taves, and received Kucherov, Morgan Riley, redraft, ESPN, head-to-head. -head. Yeah, my, my first interpretation is it looks pretty even. Um, Malkin obviously has been really good since he came back. He's looking like Malkin of old, but he's just such an injury risk at this point of his career. It used to be that Malkin was just, you know, the guy who always plays 65 games a year. But now it's he's he was injured to start the year as well. So he's someone who can be good for your team, and then he's going to fail you at a horrible time because he gets hurt. It happened last year, right? Um, so I think it's smart to sort of sell high while he's off to a really great start upon returning from his knee injury. Um, I do think Kyle Connor is a huge asset in shots, uh, and I see that that's one of your league categories so i think i'm hoping in your case that you have other players on your team that get a lot of shots in which case maybe you can afford to lose connor because otherwise i i like what you've gotten here I, I think in this trade you have the best player going to you kucherov probably the third best fantasy player morgan riley maybe devon taves is better in real life but i think morgan riley slightly better fantasy defenseman um debatable though of course taves is underrated so if we, if we accept that you, you have the number one and three guy in the deal, I think you're a winner. Uh, I'm assuming you're high in the standings, though, because Kucherov, of course, is still working his way back. He's been out of the lineup. So I'm hoping for your sake that you're kind of doing a win in the long run trade by trading guys that are more helpful in the present. And if that's the case, then I think you've made a smart trade. If you're battling for a playoff spot and you're grinding it out and just on the playoff periphery, I don't know. It could be a risky trade because you're waiting for Kucherov, but you do have the all-star break, which will help as well. So I'm going to say close trade, but I, I give you the win. All right. Next question comes from Kevin's Zwerbel. Goalies, goalies, goalies. I think this question might be about goaltenders. So they have Bobrovsky and Markstrom on one team. Should I sell high or hold them? On another team, I have Merz Lickens. Should I cut bait? And I always say it's hard to know without context what your configuration is. And if it's a four-team league, then it's like, oh, yeah, you can pick up Igor Shesterkin or something. Hey, those leagues exist. Steven played in one last year. And but, one. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, but I think in almost any scenario I can imagine, you would not want to be selling Jacob Markstrom. Uh, I ranked him as roughly a top five goalie going into the season because he gets good volume and playing on a Daryl Sutter team. You just get good defense around you. Just They funnel – the scoring chances to lower danger areas, everything just works out better for you if Daryl Sutter is your coach in terms of the defensive side of the puck. So the configuration there with that team is really good for him, for Jacob Markstrom. So I suspect that he'll continue this production all season long. Uh, and if you're looking at Bobrovsky, he's someone who's repeatedly rebounded from adversity in his career. So I'm not surprised he's having a big bounce back year. And obviously the Panthers, Panthers have been a dominant team, but on top of that, Spencer Knight has regressed and it's no fault of his own. He's a young kid and the sample size was tiny last year. It's okay that he's taking a step backward, but in a fantasy context, what's happening is he's not really pushing Bobrovsky hard. So Bobrovsky A is playing much better this year in 920 save percentage and B doesn't have as much competition as people expected him to have going into the season. So I think he'll keep that job for the foreseeable future, which makes him, I think, a top 10 goalie right now. So I, I wouldn't be looking to sell Bobrovsky. Uh, as for members Lickens, probably cut bait but it depends on your on your stat categories okay so if your league counts saves and shots against then i wouldn't necessarily drop merz lickens because that young man gets peppered 
peppered every night. No goalie in the league at five on five among qualified leaders allows more shots, or I shouldn't say allow, has more shots allowed on him. So he's a busy, busy goalie. And if you need those volume categories, he'll get them for you. If your league doesn't count saves or shots against, then I don't think he's going to be a great asset and wins because Columbus is starting to sink in the standings and goals against average. Of course, it's well north of three and save percentages. It's not great as well because he's just getting shelled. So definitely depends on your setup. Uh, but in most formats, I, I would cut bait with Merz Lickens. Yes. All right. Next question comes from Henry Sogard. I'm kind of new to fantasy hockey. Always glad to see more people playing. Uh, but are players that can play multiple four positions that much more viable than players who don't? And that's something where I've always kind of been like, I always try to get as many guys who are the uh, dual positions, but that's more for like a deep league, at least when I look at it that way. It especially used to be valuable when you had uh, defensemen who, who moved to forward. So when Brent Burns is playing right wing, but you could still start him at defense. Mark Streit was, was very good at that too. For sure. And uh, Dustin Buffler. But overall, I'd say it depends on your league size. So if you're in a small and shallow league, I would not prioritize position flexibility because the waiver wire is so bountiful. You can always find a replacement at the given position you need. Um, but if you're in a deep league, you've got position scarcity, especially at left wing. It tends to be the scarcest position there. I don't know what it is. You think mathematically there would have to be an equal number of left wingers and right wingers, but there aren't typically in fantasy hockey. I don't know why. It's just harder to find good left wingers. Uh, so in deep league, yes, I think the position flexibility matters. And where it matters most, if you play in a league with benches in which you have to rotate your starting lineup every day, guys that are flexible allow you to maximize how many starts you get in a day. Because if you have someone who qualifies at left wing, right wing, and center, maybe you can move that player to center and you can move someone else into left wing for that day. So that's the number one influencing factor. A bench league that requires daily roster swapping. That's when you want flexibility the most. All right, next question comes from Paul Sun. Among all major fantasy sites you've used, what's something you'd want to see added them to make them better? For me, it'd be more salary cap options. Yes, and that's the same for me too. So I, if you look at the keeper leagues I play in, the hockey one, and I'm in a football one as well, we have to manage our keeper contracts uh, via spreadsheets. Really is a lot of work for my dad. And when we get to our trade deadline, it's constantly, uh, who has the spreadsheet? Who has the updated spreadsheet? Oh, you made me this offer, but how many years does this player have left? What's his salary? Go get the spreadsheet. I don't have the spreadsheet. Yes, you do. It's in your inbox. My dad sent it a month ago. So all this kind of stuff goes on and on and on. It's a real pain in the butt. Uh, but if these leagues had the information readily available, it would help. So let's say someone offered you a trade and you pick up the player or you, or you click on the player and, and it shows how, how many years he has left in his contract, what his salary is in your league. That information is right there as part of his stats, that would be perfect. Because that's the way it's done in real life. You go to hockeyreference.com and you'll see a player's stats and you'll also see his contract. So I think that would be a really nice addition to all fantasy leagues. Because there's a lot of leagues that will do their own little salary. They'll be like, okay, kind of like almost a DraftKings way of, okay, the best players were $5,000, blah, blah, blah. And, and while it's good, I kind of like the real life salary cap implications where if a guy signs a new prospect if a guy elc player signs a new contract and seven million dollars a year then all of a sudden that guy's value might not match what you could have got out of him before and i think that's something that it almost just like it, it seems like it's something we've had so long to kind of make this a mainstream feature and we're still kind of waiting for that it's true and and, and i had a, a negotiation recently where i was trying to get a player from a team and he was like come on man this these offers are terrible and i'm like what are you talking about i'm giving you the best player in the deal and then after haggling back and forth he's like this my guy the player his player has several years left in his deal and i was like oh i didn't know i thought he was expiring so if i had that information regular or, or, or available to me regularly then i wouldn't have gotten myself in that quagmire that angered another team yeah, so it'd be kind of cool. Almost you see like free agent frenzy, you get this guy you're really excited about on your team, and it's like, oh, he just signed a huge contract. Okay, never mind, gone. And like having to kind of like work through that would be kind of cool, but it's something I don't know. Well, we'll see for uh, the future. Maybe we get that. Next question comes from D Dog. Do you think a trade would really help Castle find his old offensive game again, or is he at a point in his career where it might not matter? I think it could still matter. Uh, Kessel's not going to be an all-world player that wins you a championship, but I think in the right situation, he could be a point-per-game player for a short stretch. I still think he has the talent, he has the shot, he has the vision. He's, he's still a skilled hockey player. So if you take him and let's say, you know, Ryan Kennedy on our main podcast suggested the New York Rangers as a fit. So if you have Kessel out there with Artemi Panarin and, you know, working that power play, Adam Fox, Mika Zibanejad, I think Kessel's going to put up 
quite a bit of points. And I think the same thing with Colorado. That's a team that probably needs another top six forward. So if you see Phil Kessel go to the Avalanche, he explodes in value. So I do think there are plenty of scenarios in which Kessel can finish this season as a strong contributor. All right. Next question comes from VGKA78. I'm assuming they're Vegas Golden Knight fans based on this question. When Eichel returns, do you expect Chandler Stevenson's value to drastically drop? Yeah, we've seen this movie before. So based on how many times I've seen a similar situation unfold in my time at the Hockey News, I would say not right away, but definitely later. So at first, they might be easing Jack Eichel into the lineup. His ice time might be a little bit down. Uh, I think Chandler Stevenson, he's been so good, especially with Mark Stone, that you don't necessarily want to break up that chemistry. You might want Jack Eichel to drive his own line, and then you diversify your attack, right? If you're three deep with Eichel, William Carlson, and Chandler Stevenson. Uh, but long term, I think you have to assume the cream rises to the top. So once Eichel gets his sea legs, then I think he will eventually be on the top line. And if you're Vegas, if you're Pete DeBoer, you have to try it at least once. You got to try Pacioretty, Eichel, Stone. It could be the best line in the league, right? It could be the Western Conference's version of, of Marchand, Bergeron, Pasternak. So you're going to have to give it a, a whirl with all due respect to Chandler Stevenson's talent. He's had a great season. He's just not Jack Eichel. So I would say I wouldn't be surprised if in the fantasy hockey schedule, Stevenson remains relevant, but by the playoffs in real life, I think that would be when Jack Eichel starts to take over. And then going into next season, I think Stevenson moves down the depth chart. Shout out though to Stevenson for kind of making a huge name for himself this year in an opportunity yeah. where you in Vegas, you don't get a lot of great opportunities like that with the star power they have. So for him to kind of do that and everything he's done, really cool to see. Next question, I believe our last question actually, comes from DG92. Which of these goalies will be the best long-term holds? Grubauer, Rask, Peterson, Blackwood on, on IR, Ottinger, Murray, Lajmeka, and a bunch of stats there. What are your thoughts? Yeah, to me, this is actually an easy answer. I would answer it in a heartbeat, and it's Jake Ottinger. Because if you break down all the different situations, Phil Grubauer, Seattle is not the team we thought they would be. They're further behind. Tuka Rask, pending UFA again could retire. Uh, Mackenzie Blackwood has struggled horribly. Matt Murray has struggled. Carl Vemelka, bad team and small sample size. But if you look at Jake Ottinger, he's got so much going for him. He's a top prospect, first round pick, has that pedigree. He's looked quite good at the NHL level in his in his relatively small sample size so far. Ben Bishop has retired. Anton Kudobin, that contract has been buried. Braden Holpe is pending UFA. So everything sets up for Jake Ottinger to be the bell cow starter for the Dallas Stars starting next season. So I think he's a great keeper league target, really underrated keeper league target. That would be the guy, absolutely. If I were to give you a top three, I'd still put Grubauer number two because you never know, Seattle, it's still early and their roster could look a lot different next year and maybe they'll improve, right? Matty Beniers and then whoever else they draft this year, they could their, their sort of overall outlook could change quickly. So I wouldn't necessarily give up on Grubauer in keeper formats. And then it's funny, a few months ago, I would have said Mackenzie Blackwood, but every time it feels like it's happening for him, he takes a big step backwards. So I would lean toward Cal Peterson just because uh, Jonathan Quick is sort of nearing the end of the line. And we know the Kings have extended Peterson. They intend for him to be their starter long term. And just as a team, the Kings are further along in their rebuild than the Devils are. So I think I would go Peterson as my third choice. I do like Vejmelka. I know he's not obviously a high choice, but like this is a guy that we, we were making jokes at the beginning of the season. I was like, who is this guy? And he's been way better than like, like his first like 10 games. He was actually like statistically a top five goalie just with no wins. And it's yeah. just like, it's been kind of cool to see him kind of turn out the way he is. But anyways, that's it for the questions. We got our starting lineup today. Favorite movie moments submitted by stick stickly, uh, a very uh, great song by the band attack attack. Oh, there you go. I didn't know that. All right. Yes. Good category. Favorite movie moments. And don't forget, uh, for listeners, you can submit starting lineup ideas whenever you want. And they can be weird, strange. I don't care. As long as they're appropriate for a podcast, I will try to tackle, tackle them and rank them. So favorite movie moments. The way I'm judging this is moments that are burned into my brain that raise my heart rate that I'll never forget the first time I saw them. That's sort of the main criterion, especially that first time witnessing experience. So they're in random order. But Jurassic Park the brontosaurus revealed the -na 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 -na. when Sam Neill stands up, takes off his glasses, sees the brontosaurus. Because what's happening there is they're amazed. His character, Dr. Alan Grant and, and Ellie Sadler are stunned at seeing the dinosaurs, but it's also Steven Spielberg flexing saying, look, this is how you're feeling right now because I just showed you the first ever CGI dinosaurs and look how real they look. 
So I think the sort of real world and movie moment happening at the same time makes that super cool. And I still think every time I watch it, I get chills at that scene. Uh, number two, uh, Rocky one, when Rocky stands up at the end of the, I think it's the final round and they show Apollo Creed just give that look, that shaking his head. How is this guy still standing? I think it's an all time give you chills moment in any sports movie and it just stirs the heart. Love that moment as well. Uh, Goodfellas, the tracking shot of Ray Liotta and Lorraine Bracco going into the club and they're going through all the different back doors and everywhere they go, they're getting treated so well. And Henry Hill, the character is saying, don't worry about it. How did you get this table? All this kind of stuff. But of course, it's a legendary shot because it's Martin Scorsese tracking them all the way from outside through in the innards of this building and right to the front of this club. It's sort of a legendary shot and it's a magic movie moment. Number four, uh, a scene from my favorite movie ever, which is Heat. The bank robbery scene, it's, I think, the best sort of gunfight ever shown on film. The sound is deafening, it blows up your TV. The actors did so much training with the weapons to make it look real. They closed off big city blocks in LA. I think it's an unforgettable scene and it needs to be watched with major volume on your TV. Uh, number five, in Aliens, 1986, when Ripley fights the alien queen with the giant robot power loader suit, Sigourney Weaver, the big line, get away from her, you you know what? That's just a crowd-pleasing stand-up-and-cheer moment and a super thrilling battle scene between her and the queen and just the tactile effects. That scene done today would not look nearly as cool because it would be done with CGI, but in 86, the way it was done, the special effects are so tactile. It was a real giant animatronic puppet, the power loader and the queen, and the way they had to act out and stage that scene is amazing. You can look on the show, uh, the, the movies that made us on Netflix. They actually have a breakdown of how they made that if you want to check it out. And the last one, this movie hasn't actually aged that well for multiple reasons, of course. The people involved, the biggest stars that are that have the legacy around that movie, Brian Singer and Kevin Spacey, have been in the news for being involved in horrible scandals, of course. But if we're talking about the way you felt when you saw the movie... The reveal at the end of the movie of who Kaiser Soze is, is staggering the first time you see it. It's sort of a, oh my God, I can't believe I didn't see this coming. I think that's most people's experience. So definitely an unforgettable movie moment. It's too bad that it's been tainted when you think about the people involved in the movie. But if we're talking about how I feel at the how I felt at the time, then yes, it's an unforgettable movie moment. So those are my six. I'm gonna say, I think you could probably guess what movie I would pick for a certain scene. It'd be the newest Spider-Man movie. And if you haven't seen it, close your ears, but it's when all three of the Spider-Man actually got to like stand beside each other, ready to fight was super cool. Yeah. And, sure. uh, but it's kind of funny. I was trying to think of my favorite movie moments and it's almost like stupid parts in bad movies that I remember. Have you ever seen, I think I think I asked you before, but the movie Birdemic, and um, it's it's like one of the worst movies of all time. IMDb gives like a one point three rating, but basically there's a bunch of birds that are just like really poorly animated, and they're on the screen, and these people are taking like um, um, like coat hangers, and they're trying to attack them. But the thing is, like they're like overlaid on the screen where it's just a bunch of birds just doing this and they're not like interacting with the scene at all anyways it's 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 horrible movie and then there's also another one uh velocipaster where the whole storyline is a guy um his parents explode uh he drives from like i think it's michigan to china in his mustang you know normal commutes and then turns into a dinosaur and he's supposed to fight off all these ninjas uh and uh there's a scene where it's this guy in like the the a, a terrible dinosaur suit just ripping people apart. I think it's hilarious. So, uh, These movies sound a lot like if you're if if anybody out there watches Shit's Creek, um, Mora Rose's that bird movie she makes sound sounds a lot like this. So I can see the comparison there. All right. Well, see, there's there's that and one more. There's also the movie called Spaghetti Man, where a guy fuses with like spaghetti from his microwave and becomes a superhero. All great yeah. movies to watch. The big takeaway here is that Stephen and I watch different movies other than i guess we both watched spider-man and enjoyed it and that will conclude starting lineup for this episode that will conclude this episode and like i said at the beginning of the show coming later this week an updated edition of the top 250 rankings hope you enjoy the all-star break hope you enjoy watching that blackjack it looks like a lot of fun